Spring, the sun was shining, the birds were singing, the days were getting longer and warmer. But now, winter is creeping in. Those days are getting shorter. It was frosty last night. Our mood will be understandably different. But we know that we can unite around a commonality and a shared passion for wildlife. And that's why SIBC is coming back. Of course it is, it has to, doesn't it really? Because it united us so much to love the wildlife on our doorstep and provided escapism. It boosted our mood and it boosted our mental health. So we're gonna be back once a week and you can keep up to date with all the timings and the dates of that coming very soon on our Twitter and Instagram. And please like our YouTube too because we will be there and see you very shortly. Okay, see you soon. Stay safe everyone. Just over my shoulder here is our first windmill. We built it in 1996 and it was a groundbreaking windmill back then for Britain. In 2010, we built Britain's first sun park using solar panels to harness the power of the sun and make electricity. That all came to an end a couple of years later when the government basically shut the industry down. But the great news is it's back and it's back this year without the need for any kind of government support. We've got three projects that we've got planning permission, we've got grid for them, we're getting ready to start building and that's what we're going to do. Using our bills into mills model, taking the money from our customers energy bills and putting it into building new forms of green energy. So just to explain bills into mills, if uh, you know, if you've not heard it before or you're not really sure exactly what it means, it's, it's our way of describing our model. It's unique. There's no other company, as far as I know, in the world that does the same thing. We take the money that we make from our customers' energy bills and we put it back into building new forms of green energy, windmills, sun mills and things like that. Uh, we're a not-for-dividend company. It means that all of the money we make stays in the company and stays here being spent on our mission, which is to change the way energy is made in Britain. You can fight climate change with your energy bill. It's one of the biggest things anybody can do to change to uh, a green energy provider, but particularly to us because we use that money to build new forms of green energy. We don't just buy and sell something that already exists. We make the stuff and all of our customers play their part. When you pay your energy bill, you help us build new forms of green energy. You help us fight climate change. Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to another Ecotricity live stream. Tonight, we've got two fabulous guests with us. Uh, Chris Packham, wildlife expert, photographer and author. He's co-written a new book called Back to Nature, How to Love Life and Save It with Megan McCubbin. And their live streaming phenomenon, the Self-Isolation Bird Club, is back on YouTube this Sunday. And we've also got Dale Vince, founder of Ecotricity, the world's first green energy company. He's also the chairman of Forest Green Rovers and creator of the Sky Diamond. Dale's also author of Manifesto. It's a part memoirs and part plan to save the world. And that one's out tomorrow. Uh, welcome and good evening to you both. Yeah, Good evening. Thanks, Hi, Chris. Hi. How are you? Yeah, I'm good, thanks. Yeah, I've, uh, I've had a busy day book signing and getting ready for tomorrow, but, uh, you know, that's been novel and fun, but, uh, you know, in good spirits. You didn't sign yeah, mine. Nice one. Oh, no. <laughs> I'll have um, to do that. Listen, I'm going to kick off before, because I've just got to get this in, because we, we, we've kind of communicated indirectly about it, but I need to ask you personally. Um, it's, it's, it's at the end of the book. It's the very last thing in the book, actually. But let's start at the end and then work yeah. forward um, and start off with something which I just find astonishing and ultimately extraordinarily romantic, sky diamonds. I mean, just tell, tell us all about that. I mean, it, it is... I, I, for me, it's just beautiful, absolutely beautiful. Oh, thank you. I love it too. Um, for me, it's like uh, modern alchemy. And when I had the idea, I just thought it sounded amazing and I just had to try and find a way to do it. So this is about 10 years ago. And I was thinking about geoengineering. And this is a concept of uh, kind of engineering the, the environment in a way that we can take carbon out of the atmosphere on a kind of planetary scale. It's a, kind of potentially scary topic, but I was thinking about the idea of getting carbon out of the atmosphere uh, because at some point we have to do that. We have to stop, first of all, putting carbon into the atmosphere, but then at some point we've got to recognize 
that it's uh, higher than it's been, the level of carbon for millions of years, so we have to take it out. And when we take it out, we actually have to store it in a form that will be enduring, otherwise, you know, it's all been for nothing. And, and the thought struck me that the most permanent form of carbon known to mankind is a diamond. And, and then I had the idea, what if we could take carbon from the atmosphere, something we have too much of, and we could make diamonds with it. And, and I was kind of struck by the idea. Seven years ago, we began a, an, an R&D journey looking into how we might be able to make that possible. A couple of years ago, we started making them, uh, perfecting the recipe. And a couple of weeks ago, we launched it on the world. So. They have it, and I absolutely love it. It's something that's excited me for probably all the years since I thought of it, and, and I've been desperate to kind of talk about it and tell everybody. I've probably told half a dozen people in all this time, and, and I'm amazed that it's been kept such a such a secret. But it is. And, and the diamonds themselves, I mean, obviously there's the, the bling side of diamonds as, as jewellery, where they've always been revered as a, as a very rare thing basically. Um, but I mean, are they also going to be sort of industrial diamonds, which have multifold uses as well? Uh, in, in which case, there's, well, forgive me, but the sky's the limit, isn't it, in, in terms of what you could do with your diamonds? Yeah, it is. You know, industrial diamonds have, uh, you know, have a great deal of uh, practicality and they're actually easy to make. The, uh, the hard part is to make the kind of flawless, uh, good colour quality stones that people want to have in jewellery. And and you're right, we do think of them as rare and we revere them. But, uh, you know, that's really a function of very successful marketing by De Beers that began in the 50s. Diamonds aren't actually rare at all. <laughs> There's plenty of them around. Uh, but a little bit like OPEC, they do control the market. They also set the price in the market to be uh, really quite detached from the cost of extraction. Um, um, one thing we found when looking into diamonds was there was no independent report on the impact of diamond mining. You couldn't find one anywhere. There were industry-sponsored ones, um, and they did uh, a pretty poor job of it. So we engaged uh, Imperial College London to produce a report for us a few months ago. It came out a couple of weeks ago, and, and it, it showed just how big the environment impact of diamond mining is. So we set out to do this as a way to absorb carbon and, and lock it up into something quite beautiful. We found that there's not actually a lot of carbon in a stone, but what we found is the avoided carbon in diamond mining is, is really quite colossal. It's about 110 kilograms of CO2 for every tiny little carat of stone, but worse than that, it's 1,100 tons of rock and soil blasted and dug out and displaced for every same tiny carat of diamond and about 4,000 liters of water big impact on the environment, on wildlife. The holes are big enough to be able to see them from outer space. And of course, the social conditions for the people that work there are really poor. So diamond mining has this hideous impact. And although we started down this road as environmentalists thinking this is a great way to get carbon from the air, what we found is we're able to say, do you know what? We, we can end diamond mining. So we've called for the end of diamond mining saying, arguing basically that we don't need to mine the earth now for diamonds, we can mine the sky. And I, I see it as a kind of 21st century piece of technology. Uh, we can fight the climate crisis with it. We can uh, uh, you know, play our part in sustainable living, uh, which is really important. Uh, and we can do this in a way that's not low carbon or, or zero carbon, it's actually negative carbon. And it kind of fits with the theme of our work, Chris, which is that um, going green isn't about giving stuff up. You know, That's a myth that we really have to deal with because it holds us back, it holds a lot of people back. Our argument is that we can live the kind of life that we want to live, we just have to do everything differently and actually do them in a better way. And all of that is possible for us. We've been doing it in energy, transport and food like forever, and now we're doing it in diamonds as our new frontier. But surely this is an opportunity then to put, I mean, the, the, the reputation of dining, diamond mining, as you mentioned, you know, in terms of the uh, the social aspects of it, it's horrendous. So this this surely should be a time for that we should all be campaigning to put an end to that. Finally, shouldn't it? Yeah, I agree. <clears throat> I agree. When we launched Sky Diamonds, we said exactly that. Let's end diamond mining. We no longer need to do it. Uh, all of the, there's nothing good about diamond mining, uh, but the the marketing of diamonds is so successful. They keep all of that stuff invisible, and all they present to us uh, are these very special little stones. Uh, that, are, that are super expensive and allegedly rare, uh, which they're not. And um, it's, it's, a, it's a miracle of marketing since the 50s, really, uh, that the beers have created uh, value in a diamond. They, they virtually had no value before then. Uh, and
and now then, of course, they have. I'm not talking down the value of a sky diamond, by the way, <laughs> but this is absolutely just where, where we are with it, you know. It's an artificial market. So how do people get a, a sky diamond, you know, if they want to go down on one knee and pop the question, or, or <laughs> in that point of view, how, how do they get a sky diamond? Yeah, at the moment, um, there's no way. Uh, early in the new year, we, um, we're going to launch a joint venture with, uh, with a designer jeweler. We've not announced it yet, so I probably shouldn't hear, but there's a range of, uh, there's a range of stuff that's been designed, a, a special five set of diamond cuts that are, that are unique and, and kind of play to the themes of sky mining. Uh, I'm wearing uh, one piece here. I don't think you can see it very well. I'll just come up to the camera. But there it is. This is my, there's a little diamond in the middle of that. Uh, but there is, there is another way, uh, short term. With the, uh, with the book going on sale tomorrow, we've decided to do a bit of a Willy Wonka thing and stick 10 diamond tickets in the books. Um, and, and a diamond ticket, if you get one, will entitle you to a one carat sky oh, diamond I'm and a tour. I'm just leaving blue. I'm just having a quick leave blue. <laughs> Yeah, I should say, actually, it's a, no, you haven't lost yet. You haven't lost yet because it's a virtual diamond ticket because we, uh, we came up with the idea once the book had already been printed. Uh, so there was no easy way to put them in the book. So um, we're having, in effect, a draw. And um, oh, a problem uh, we're having a draw, basically. So uh, everybody that has a book qualifies to go in the drawer and has a chance to win an actual diamond ticket. So don't worry that you haven't found one. That's a great idea. I love the idea. It's much better than a bar of chocolate, I've got to say. And, <laughs> and me, you know, it's, I, what I like, obviously, is it's a multifaceted, again, forgive the pun, like, it is the fact that um, it, it is intrinsically romantic to, to make diamonds out of the sky. And for them to be doing an environmental job and also a socio-economic job when it comes to you know reducing the hideous conditions and pollution and, and impact of diamond mining is is, is surely the best win-win-win we've had for ages. It's got it's got yeah. three key ingredients: environment, romance, and a better world. Yeah, and, and you know what? There's there's another aspect of it. In in my book, I talk about renewable energy as a great great democratizing uh, force because at the moment, oil and gas is located in certain parts of the world, you know, in the Middle East, for example, in North America. And that has driven politics and, and economies, you know, it, it drives our world, the fact that only some countries have these resources. Renewable energy is available to every country in the world. Every country in the world has enough wind and sun to power itself completely. That's an absolute fact. So it's a great democratizing force for the future as we switch to renewable energy and away from fossil fuels. In the same way, at the moment, diamond mining is is centered in certain geographies in the world, Africa, Russia, I think Canada as well. Sky diamond mines can be built in every country of the world so we can democratize diamond mining. Yeah, great, good stuff. I saw a map the other day, there's a new book coming out actually uh, by a German publishing house magazine actually it transformed it into a book, same publishers that we're, that we're using, I think. and. Um, and it, it had a map of the world and it had a tiny square in the middle of the Sahara. And, and that tiny square represented the area that if we gave it over to solar, could power the rest of the world. And then they had another one with a tiny square, globally speaking, where if that was wind energy, we could power the world. And a third map, it's, 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 a, it's a really good book actually. And um, it's coming out after Christmas, I think. And the... Um, and all of these graphics really poignantly and, and picturesquely show us that, in fact, what we're doing is grotesquely inefficient. Even they, they, they had another map of the oceans with a little square on it again, um, where if we were harv harvesting algae from the sea, essentially plankton, planktonic algae from the sea, you know, we could substitute all of our you know, green terrestrial production plants, etc. Um, by doing that as well. I'm not suggesting that we should do all these things, but what it really puts it in context that, you know, all of these things are so eminently possible that it's almost impossible, you know, to imagine equally that we're not just getting on with it. Yeah, I sometimes think it's hard to grasp just how wastefully we live, how our economy works. Um, you know, we burn 
50 billion pounds worth of oil and gas every year in this country. We, we buy it from global uh, markets, we bring it here, we burn it, it goes up in smoke and then we do it all again. That's a billion pounds every week. If we invest that money instead in the means to harvest renewable energy, it has no fuel cost once we've built the machine. We've got zero cost, we've got zero price fluctuation. We have to buy oil and gas in dollars, which gives us a different economic problem. We can do away with all of that, create hundreds of thousands of jobs uh, and make our own energy here in Britain. We can not be a part of uh, oil wars and not be affected by cartels and, and all this kind of stuff. Um, so I think there's a wonderful opportunity in harnessing renewable energy. It's a little bit back to the future, I think, because that's what used to power the world. But of course, we've got a technical angle on that now with PV and, and modern windmills and stuff. Um, but it's so sensible and, and it, you know, it's going to clean up the air that we breathe and free us economically from this international system that uh, is, is kind of basically stifling us as a country. And, 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 and we're still granting and, and licenses for oil exploration in the UK. I mean, you couldn't make it up, could you? I mean, it's balmy. You know, it, it, the, the writing is very firmly on the wall, and it's been written in, 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 you know, pretty bold script by the scientist who we trust and who have the authority to, to, to say this stuff. And they've, and they've told us that we're in deep, deep, deep trouble. There's no ambiguity about it. No one's escaped this warning call. And yet our government is still granting license, licenses for oil and gas exploration, not exploitation, but future ex, e exploration. It's madness. Uh, uh, I'm with you there. And I think they pledged 500 million this week on uh, research for mini nuclear power stations, the idea of uh, you know, making them smaller and just having dozens of them around the country, which I think is a, a proliferation nightmare. Uh, but also nuclear energy is so incredibly expensive. Ever since the 50s, it's broken all of its promises to get better, to get cheaper, to get quicker. It's never done any of those things. It's always been behind budget and behind time. And, and our government wants to uh, do more. Well, I can't believe that. No. In fact, uh, this Friday, I'm working uh, with the RSPB. We're doing a, a similar little broadcast uh, because obviously Sizewell C um, it's right alongside Minsmere, one of the jewels in our conservation crown in the UK. And we're worried about the, the impact that that will have in terms of the build itself, the space it will occupy, the impact that will it have on that immediate environment. But aside from Minsmere being, as I said, a jewel in our conservation crown, incredibly biodiverse, managed for years, brilliant teams of people, always been at the cutting edge of sort of land-based conservation. In, in, in the UK, um, it, I see it as a symbolic thing. You know, why would you put another nuclear power station on top of something or alongside um, something um, like like that? It's it's just so wrong headed, basically. It is. It is wrong headed. It's not had to go ahead yet, so uh, I hope that it doesn't get no. go ahead. But but you're right to fight it. I'm reminded of fracking as well. You know, I think uh, we've spent the last 10 years almost, I think, fighting off fracking, this kind of nightmare idea of destroying the ground underneath our feet to extract some gas from. And the Conservatives changed planning law and environment regulations to try and push this through, introduced the most generous, as they called it, tax regime in the world to encourage fracking against the opinion of local people. You know, opinion polls showed 70% opposition to fracking. At the same time, 70% support for wind, which the Tories banned because they said it was unpopular. Uh, you, yeah. you couldn't make that stuff up either. No. But no. Uh, at least fracking hasn't gone ahead. You know, it's, it's, it's really struggled, I think, with its safety issues. And, and I think it's been overtaken by events now. You know, renewable energy is so cheap. Fracking is so unpopular and it has this safety problem. Uh, I don't think it's going to go ahead. Yeah. Can, can I just say this has been an incredible start and we've had hundreds of messages in already so thank you very much to everybody. If you're new to the world of ecotricity, if you switch to ecotricity to get 100% uh, renewable electricity, 100% green energy and carbon neutralised gas, we can actually do that for RSPB and we'll give £50 a year annual payment to the RSPB for every every person that moves to ecotricity so that's one of the offers we're doing the details are flashing along on the screen you can get your questions in both on Chris's Facebook page
page and on the uh, Dale Vince and the Ecotricity Facebook pages at the moment. And I've got one that I'm going to ask you both. Um, has, has lockdown been positive for the planet? And we'll start with you, Chris. Yeah, it should have been positive for the planet because it should have taught us a very, very harsh lesson. And as Dale says and points out in his book, you know, this is an artifact of our abuse of the environment. Um, and there's no ambiguity about that. that that's a fact. Um, and it should have given us the opportunity to stop and think and realize that we don't want to go back to so-called business as normal because it was abjectly bad business and the normal was pretty abnormal. Um, and we should have used it as an opportunity to move forward. And there have been you know, deals put on the table. Wildlife and Countryside Link went to the government in the wake of the corona crisis and said, look, we've spoken to all of these NGOs. We've come up with all of these shovel ready projects, as we call them. If you give us 300 million pounds, we can create 200,000 hectares of fabulous new wildlife habitat in the UK. We can employ tens of thousands of people generating new jobs. Um, we needed 300 and we got 40. Um, and a little bit more popped up the other day. Um, and, and what it shows, and I think again, you know, this it emanates from aspects of Dale's book, the manifesto part of, of that, is that what we have at the moment in these extraordinary times are a very, you know, desperately, um, you know, un, uh, unable collection of politicians. And, and they, globally, I'm speaking about here, and, and they simply just don't have the vision. Um, to, to look into that future, which so many of us can see could be a much healthier place to be. Um, and that is undoubtedly at this point holding us back. But I think it's generating uh, increased frustration as we see the solutions that are being put on the table. We see the technologies, we see the aptitudes and energies that people have to, to put things right. And when they're not being implemented, we're beginning to get increasingly cross about it. So I am optimistic that you know, in the, in, the, in the very near future, things will probably cascade quite quickly. And just to, to finish on that point, I think one of the problems that we have, and we touch upon this in, in the book that we've written, actually, is that we grow up to think that the world is a big place geographically. You know, we think it's because we can't ever see over the horizon. We imagine it as being vast. And the statistic that I generated for, for our book was that if you drive from Land's End to to John O'Groats, and then you do that another 13 times, you could, theoretically, have driven to Australia. Just 14, it's 14 times the distance. So the world is quite a small place. It's not an, an, an enormous planet. It's a relatively small planet, crowded with enormous numbers of humans consuming as much as they possibly can and way too much. Um, and, and equally, things that we do in our part of the world have an impact on others. And today I've been speaking um, about some research, or in fact, journalism, uh, undercover journalism, investigative journalism, I should say, um, that's exposed the fact that, you know, a, a chicken food manufacturer in the UK is using soy that's come from the Cerrado in Brazil, which is one of the areas that's both rapidly being deforested, um, a unique part of our planetary ecosystems, fabulous number of endemic species that can found, be found there and nowhere else, really rich biodiversity, but it's being burned like so much of the rest of uh, uh, you know, Brazil's forest to grow soy. And it comes into the UK where it's fed to chickens um, and those chickens end up in Tesco's, Aldi, Lidl, um, you know, uh, McDonald's and, and Nando's, I think it was. So if you go into one of those places, although you don't, aren't faced with the, the choice because the food labeling is so poor, you can't make an environmental choice. You can make an economic choice about what you buy, but not an environmental choice. So you can't reconcile your purchase with the environmental cost of the product. Um, but you are connecting yourself to deforestation in South America. As every time you pick up a product which is full of palm oil, you connect yourself with deforestation in Indonesia. So we have to accept that we as individuals here in the UK in, in 2021, when, when we on a daily basis we eat, which most of us do on a daily basis, we are joining ourselves to other parts of what is essentially a really small planet. And that I think is where 
a lot of people struggle, they, they struggle to get to that point. And when they watch wildfires burning in Australia, and when they watch flooding in Indonesia or the southern states of America, and California burning in, in, in the west of America, it seems a long way away, but it's not. And these people are essentially our neighbors. They're the same species as us on the same planet at the same time. And I, but I do feel it's rather sad that it's only when our you know, next door neighbors, uh, you know, when their house is on fire that we might think about doing something. And it's, for, you know, I, I mean, there were terrible, terrible floods last year in, in, in the UK, which affected hundreds of thousands of people, damaged their livelihoods, their lives, their businesses, etc. as a result of, uh, you know, uh, climate change. But even then, there's not enough pain for our politicians to think we've got to do something about this. We've got to take this issue seriously. And I, I wonder how bad things will have to get before they finally wake up to the fact that climate change isn't happening over there. It's happening here, right now. A lot of good points there. I think, um, actually, just on that last point, the, the same is true in terms of deforestation of the Amazon. Uh, you know, it gets uh, it gets a lot of attention and emotion quite rightly. But what we overlook here is we've already done this to our country. We've already dewilded it. You know, the, the loss of species in our country is just incredible. And have seen and it's taken place in the last 50 years due to industrial farming so in some ways it's hypocritical of us to tell other countries what not to do with their country uh, while we've done that to our country and until at least we put it right but food choice is the big key to this uh, and you know i'm staggered by the fact that if we all go plant-based instead of eating animals we can free up 75 percent of the world's farmland and so here in britain that means 50 percent of our land mass we just don't need to feed ourselves. We can actually give back to nature and we can reverse that awful trend of the last 50 years. And that gets me quite excited as an environmentalist because it's a kind of, <clears throat> it's a major piece of the puzzle. When we solve the problems of energy, transport and food and we live differently, we, we happen to free up this immense amount of land that we can give back to wildlife, which is missing from our lives and our country. And at the same time, this land will be a carbon sink. And when we look to get to zero carbon by 20, whenever, the last few percent of our carbon footprints is going to be really hard to eradicate. But we can take care of that with indigenous offsetting by rewilding, let's say, half of our country. It doesn't take that much, but that will be available to us if we all go plant based. And um, picking up on the food labeling point, Chris, I, I think actually. It's, uh, it's also necessary to label food in terms of uh, how it's produced, as well as where it comes from and, and the impact of that. You're absolutely right. But the, uh, the conditions in chicken farms, they are just awful. The, the way that those animals are treated is, is obscene. Uh, I, I wanna say it's inhuman, but it clearly isn't because it goes on. And it's not just chickens, of course, and pigs and cows and all farmed animals are treated so abhorrently in industrial farming. We don't see that. We see a sanitized product on the shelf of a shop, uh, shrink wrapped in plastic. We might call pig pork and we might call cow beef. Um, we don't think of the suffering and the endless cycle of suffering, actually. I mean, here in Britain alone, we kill a billion animals every year. I mean, you know, which is just well, it's three million every day we kill for food that we don't need to eat. It takes incredible resources to actually grow those animals for food. It's um, inefficient, you know, for, in the worst case for a cow, you put 10 times as much plant protein to, into a cow to get, uh, this, to, to get, uh, you know, uh, cow protein back 10 for one. Sorry, I'm, <laughs> I lost myself there. The, you know, you, you, uh, there's an inefficiency ratio of 10 to one with cow farming. It, uh, the, the peak of it is, I think, fish farming. Chickens are at the high end of efficiency, but they always give you less back than what you have to put in. It's just an inefficient way to feed ourselves which is why we can free up 75% of farmland uh, if we all go plant-based. And I just think it's a wonderful opportunity to put right so many things that are wrong in our world. Ben, I, you know, one oh, of the things, sorry, Chris. Well, well, yeah, just one of the things we were thinking about doing, Meg and I, we had this little guerrilla campaign. You, you know when, um, I, I, I've never smoked, so I, I, I don't know when, or if this still continues, but for a while at least, they were putting photographs of people's 
very badly damaged lungs and cardiovascular system onto cigarette packets as a means of exposing them to what will happen if you smoke, essentially. Well, Megs and I had this idea that we would get some photographs of these ghastly industrial farming units that you mentioned in terms of the chickens and, and everything else. And then we would stick those on, on packets in supermarkets. But, because basically, if people saw the conditions that that animal had lived in, I think that would ha that would have an impact on it. There, you know, the supermarket's ability to sell it. But again, that, from my point of view, would be a, a really simple, brutal way of exposing the fact, as that you pointed out, that we have, we've got this idea that everything's rosy here in the UK because we're part of a westernised uh, European country, and it's not. And in fact, on the 30th of this month, I'm working with um, a charity called Open Cages. And we're going to be exposing some news about chickens and what's happening to them and, and stuff. So we'll be prepared for that in a few days' time. And it's pretty grizz, you know, grisly, miserable stuff. And it's here in the UK. It, it's happening literally in our back garden. And but people go into the supermarkets and they've no idea of the welfare conditions that these animals are kept in. That's right. It's part of our great disconnect. I agree with you. And I think tobacco is a great model because um, there, there was like a transition in tobacco, uh, ultimately uh, taking all the branding off of tobacco so you couldn't create some kind of branded cachet around the product. And then ending up, as you say, with those hideous photographs of diseased lungs and, and, and that kind of stuff uh, to show people the reality of smoking. And of course, it was taxed like hell as well. You know, I think we do need a meat tax. At the moment, we subsidize animal farming, which is absurd because it causes so much environment degradation and human health problems. Uh, and we hide from people the truth, the fact of how it's made. And uh, I think tobacco is a great model for that. I'm going to read a bit from your book, Will. Um, uh, sorry, Dale, here we go. Um, so this is, uh, you, it, this is a bit in, in the section about forest green rivers, but it's where you deal with the food thing. Uh, you say food is a bigger issue. It started with what the Sun called the red meat ban. I loved that. It dramatised the issue and was great publicity for the cause. We started there and within three seasons we were entirely vegan. We took a gradual approach. No red meat, then white meat, fish, cheese and milk. Food is where we met the most resistance. This is talking about your transitions that you've made at Forest Green Rovers, of course. Um, food is where we met the most resistance and gained the most infamy. <laughs> For me, it's a Borg from Star Trek thing. Resistance is futile. We were never going to change this. I would rather have walked away. For me, going animal free is always about three things, ethics, climate and health. But this was football. And on top of these three reasons to be vegan, said in the voice of Ian Jury, the burgers being served were grim. They cost pennies because they were made from parts of an animal body no one else wanted. Lips, ears, bums is not an exaggeration. And we replaced them with really high quality plant food. The idea was to make something that was not just animal free, that people would enjoy eating more. The bar was low. <laughs> Some man said that we were dictating what they could eat. We disagreed. We told them we were simply setting the menu like every restaurant or food outlet does. We were doing it according to our principles. And by the way, football at home is only two hours every fortnight on average. Why come expecting to eat what you normally eat? Why not come and try something different? We went out of our way to put on really good food, handmade, super tasty, and often the kind you wouldn't expect at football. Our fans did try it, and in a very short period of time, this was all history, for us anyway. It's still the big thing that all the visiting media want to talk about nearly 10 years later. <laughs> I love that book, Benny. We've had so many questions for you both, and one of the most commonly occurring ones is, when are you both standing for Parliament? <laughs> <laughs> well, I have a vicious retort for that, which is, if I wanted to hang out with clowns, I'd run away to the circus. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty good. And, and, you know, I've always been um, put off by the idea of politics by the people that are in it, you know, um, in the same way. The, the kind of modern thing in politics, I assume it's modern anyway, is, is to just never answer a question, which I don't understand. Uh, you know, I, I, I can't understand that at all. 
I couldn't and can't ever do that. But um, I think politicians give politics a bad name, but it doesn't mean necessarily we should let them be, leave them to it, because these guys and girls are running our country, you know, and, and look what a mess they're making of it. So I'm, I'm kind of tempted to get into politics because I look at the people that are doing it now and I think they're doing an awful job and, and actually all of our arguing and campaigning and the work that we do to make things better has an impact, but we could have a much bigger impact if we had the leaders of power. So it's kind of tempting me. It is kind of tempting, but don't you think that our political system is, is, is you know, we don't have proportional representation, mm -hmm. so we still get elected officials who basically are in the minority. Um, our terms of office are so short that certainly when it comes to, you know, um, safeguarding or, or ring fencing environmental projects, they really suffer in a political system because it switches from one objective to another, from one party to another, from one fashion to another, when really all of that should be taken outside of politics and, and basically given public money independent from it. Um, I'm not sure that, you know, Aside from, if you said to me I could be a, big, a benign dictator for a couple of years, I, I, I might be tempted. But to go through the, the rigours of having to deal with a, a political system, which is essentially pretty undemocratic, I'm, I'm not sure I've got the patience for that. Really. Prizes available. Yeah, Prizes available. Sorry, really you must... you're, you're overlapping. I just want to say we see that exactly the same way. I think benign dictatorship, uh, I think it's the way to go. And democracy has severe shortcomings. If this is democracy, if, if what happens in America is democracy, oh my God, you know, it's a system with problems. If you send in uh, a picture of Dale or Chris as a benign dictator, you'll get a signed copy of their book. We'll, uh, we'll, 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 we'll sort that out for you. Uh, here's a good one for both of you. How do you both deal with the haters? I don't um, know I had any. <laughs> Um, well, hold on a moment. Hold on a moment. You, on the cover of the book, Maverick <laughs> Entrepreneur, and, and, and reading first, you know, through the first, I mean, it, it, things didn't go particularly well with Thames, um, as I read today. I didn't know about that, actually, so that was all news to me. Um, but you've had a few struggles, so you, you've left a few people who aren't fans in your wake. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's true. I was being flippant, uh, but I was also making a point. That's how I deal with it, you know. Uh, I don't worry about it. It doesn't exist. No, I've got to say, same with me. It just goes straight over my head. I'm afraid, if anything, it fuels my determination, um, never diminishes it. Um, and I understand it as being part of a process. If you're asking people to change their minds more rapidly than they're capable of, um, then some of them, unfortunately, will just simply lash out. Um, and, and that's, again, part and parcel of that process. And my job, our job, I suppose, is just to soak it up. Um, and, and keep going, but uh, it's it's it will and never ever get to me. It it, it, it can't. So um, there is a, and, and in a way, I suppose it, there are a couple of things. Well, Billy Bragg said said to me, that, you know, a little while ago, if you're not over, you know, if you're not getting flat, you're not over the target. So I always use it as an indication <laughs> of the fact that I'm actually doing some good. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> yeah. One here. Hi, Chris. I watched your uh, Spurgeous documentary and thought it was great. I'd like to know what advice you have for kids. My daughter has a diagnosis for not feeling like she fits in and she's struggling to find out who she is. She just doesn't know what to do in life. Any advice you can give? Um, I don't know about ad advice, but I can, I can tell you that I, I firmly believe that as you get older, it gets easier. Because as a child or a young person, you're not entirely con in control of your environment, uh, temporal, emotional, spatial, anything. Um, and the more control you are able to take over that environment and your life, um, the easier it is for you to manage it to suit you. Um, and I think that I struggled as a child and as a young person because I was forced to fit in, as most children and young people are. So they are forced to fit in by the fact that their parents are making all the decisions at home. And then they go to school and they've got to arrive there at 8.30 and leave at 4 and they've got to do maths on Tuesday and English on Wednesday. Um, and, and it's not always a system, uh, you know, that's set up to best suit you. And therefore it can cause and, and generate all sorts of problems. But as you get older, you get more control to decide, you know, what you do, when you do it, how you do it, how you feel about it. 
Um, and all of those things lead to, albeit gradual, in improvements. And I do remember even, I mean, I've no, with no disrespect to my parents who were, you know, on the whole were fabulous parents and enormously supportive of everything that I wanted to do. Um, but when I could actually just paint my bedroom the colour I wanted it and put things where I wanted them and keep them where I wanted them and no one moved them, um, I, I, I felt comfortable in that one room. And as you get older, you are able to shape the world around you so that you are comfortable in it outside of that room. So I think you've got that to look forward to. And I think that in contemporary times, if you are struggling, then you should speak to people because far more people understand the condition of autism now than they did when I was a child in the 1960s and 70s. Um, and you should equally try and find the means of articulating those problems that you have um, and, and also to healthcare professionals too, because again, going back to 60s and 70s, um, through no fault of their own, they didn't know anything about it. Um, and we were left to our own devices to um, suffer or succeed as the case may be. But now there, there is help available and there are a number of charities that are, do really, really good work. Um, and so I think it's, you know, try to find your voice and, 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 and carve an easier path for yourself than perhaps some of us older people had to do. And, 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 and in many cases, the changes that you might be requesting are, are so minor that either your parents or your school teachers or your lecturers or your employers um, can easily accommodate them. And of course, it's in their interest because if they do, you will prosper and they will prosper in turn. So speak up, speak out, and, and don't be afraid to ask for help. That's, uh, that's brilliant stuff, actually. A lot of that resonates with me. Uh, the stuff around control, the, the experience as a kid, I had all of that. I'm a child of the 60s and 70s as well. And, uh, and I've just always uh, ex assumed and accepted that I was, I was different and um, as a kid I was a difficult kid that's that's what uh, that's how I was seen and treated uh, no, no doubt about it and uh, it was just a couple of years ago that I had a diagnosis of the same thing Asperger's uh, and it made such a great deal of sense to me but what you're saying there Chris about control and being able to paint your own bedroom put your things where you want them and that kind of stuff and the rules of school I bumped into them in the most uh, you know complete fashion um, and, and all of that turned me into a kind of uh, serial rebel as a kid, which ultimately drove me onto the road. Uh, you know, I lived for 10 years that way. Um, but I found my path, and uh, I think you're right, it does get easier. Um, although I think we're both now trying to kind of uh, create the rules to make the world the kind of place we want to live in, which is a great thing. Um, but, you know, I, I think uh, it's actually a superpower as well uh, because it enables incredible focus that not everybody is capable of. Uh, and it's helped me to do some things that seemed impossible to everybody around me, um, and, and which have led to ecotricity and some other things. And uh, so, you know, I see it as a superpower. And I think fitting in is overrated. Uh, I don't think it's necessary. I think we're, we're all different anyway, even before... I knew my diagnosis, I, you know, I was just happy to be different, but we are all different. And um, as you say, just speak out and uh, ask for what it is that you need. I think that is, that is brilliant advice. Yeah, I, I always say, you know, maybe Asperger's is a gift, but when you open it, you don't always get what you want. And I think <laughs> that, you know, on the good days, you open it and, and it's something that sparkles and shines and it is empowering and you sense that you, you, you have the capacity to do things that maybe other people don't or they aren't brave enough to do or something like that, you know. And then other days, obviously, it can be quite um, disempowering and, and, and it requires a lot of management. But um, I, I think, it, I, I sincerely hope that, it's, it's, it, that it should be easier for young people now than it was when, when we were kids, you know. Because if, if you think about it, Dale, you know, we, we had to overcome those um, difficulties through devising our own systems of management, self-management, and, and so on and so forth. Um, and it did lead to enormous amounts of conflict. And again, you know, that's one thing that comes over in the book is that 
you know, if, if we have traits which are shared, we don't take no for an answer. We're ferociously determined, pig-headed, some people might say, you know, to the point that we won't give up. Um, and, and, and those are, I see those in the long term as, as assets, you know, because sometimes, you know, like you've had, you know, you outline here, you know, it's a, it's a tough fight and you've got a lot of people against you and you're not picking the fight to win. You're picking the fight because it's the right thing to do, you know, and there's a significant difference. And people don't get that sometimes. They they, they you know, why are you doing that? You're never going to win. Well, I don't have a choice because I don't like injustice. It's the it's what I have to do. You know, I, I don't expect to win. For me, I was I said in the book that I wrote, which is a you know similar in terms of its outlook to yours, in that it's a bit of a memoir, but also a bit of a manifesto. Um, certainly for Aspergers, is that for me, winning isn't giving up. It's not about crossing a line, getting an award, getting a cup. Winning is actually just never stopping, just keeping going relentlessly, pursuing what you believe to be right. Um, yeah. That's all I can do. I, I, um, <laughs> I, I share all of that. I mean, so much that resonates with me, particularly the, the sense of injustice. I have a, a very heightened sense of injustice, and not just stuff that happens to me or stuff that I see around me. You know, I've been driven crazy by what's happening in Palestine for all of my adult life, for example. Um, but yeah, and the fights I've got into, I haven't chosen them. I just haven't chosen to back down or, or not have them. And it's always about principle. And and frequently I've been told you can't win, you know, uh, you'll lose everything uh, or you know whatever it is. I'm not interested or, or bothered. It's not part of my uh, decision making. The decision is already made because somebody's pushing me. And whenever I'm pushed, I just push back. It's like a law of, a, a law of physics, you know, one of these equal and opposing full step things. I've got a bit... Back. Yeah, actually, which is pertinent to this, as you say here, people can hold you back too. The world is tribal, made up of groups of people who self-identify to one degree or another and see others as outsiders. I've been an outsider much of my life, since being a kid. I've made the transition to the inside of various groups and eventually needed to leave because it was restricting. People don't want other people to change. They think they know you and resist change in the same way they resist change more generally. Um, and again, that's part and parcel of that life struggle, which is, I mean, what we're essentially trying to do, you know, what, what you're trying to do in, and, and, and in parallel, you know, and, and in sympathy, what I'm trying to do is ask people to change their minds, just change their minds and do things differently. You know, you, you put everything on the plate in front of them and you say, look, this is the way it is. I'm telling you the truth. Please think about it and change your mind. And from my point of view, where it gets frustrating is where you've got overwhelming evidence that that's the right thing to do, whether it's legal, ethical, moral, social, scientific, whatever it happens to be, and people move too slowly. <laughs> As an old punk rocker, you know, we don't really dally around you know, for, with a with a seventeen minute track of prog rock, you know, it's all over in three minutes for us. <laughs> <laughs> we want instant results. You know. yeah. can, can I say shout out to all the people that have posted Chris and Dale as benevolent dictators? There's some pretty good people out there with the art skills this evening. So thank you very much. Uh, we have a question here, and this is from Boris on Facebook. Probably not Boris Johnson. He's probably doing something else but lord knows what question for both chris and dale how can we protect the environment when the government is trying to destroy it by building hs2 over a hundred acres of ancient woodland which is being destroyed how can we stand up to them when protesters are being prosecuted well i fought hs2 through the courts um this year um i took the legal case whilst there was that avenue open um because again i was following a democratic you know path and, and, and that was available to me. Um, I've always saluted those protesters on the front line. I think they're at the cold face of conservation. Dale, you've been there, Battle of the Beanfield, etc, etc, first hand. Um, that's the very difficult place to be. Keyboard warriors like myself taking legal, legal challenges is one thing, but we play to our strengths and, and that was what I was able to do. Um, in the end, a decision was made by the judges who basically uh, you know, to paraphrase it, assured me that the entire cabinet, this is the contemporary cabinet, the one we've got at the moment, 
or well, certainly the one that we had at Christmas uh, after the Okabee review when they decided to plough on with this project. The entire cabinet was au fait with the environmental impact assessments of HS2, which bear in mind had been made like, I don't know, 2013, years before. Um, I don't know what that cabinet were doing years before, but I doubt that they were reading the environmental impact assessments of HS2. And then secondly, that the entire cabinet, and you know who they are, um, are au fait with the UK's obligations when it came, comes to the Paris uh, Accord. Now, that was the judgment, effectively. So make of that what you will. I think that going back to my previous point, when it comes to HS2, um, there are a plethora of reasons why this project is um, improper. And eventually, very sadly, after a lot of damage has been done, a lot of people have um, been hurt financially, economically, socially and emotionally. A lot of wildlife has been destroyed, including those ancient woodlands that you mentioned. I, I, it, I just can't see it happening. The bill keeps going up. You know, we've borrowed more money than ever before on account of the pandemic. We're in desperate debt and yet we're, we're spending clearly a lot more than a hundred billion pounds on this project, which is about moving people between, well, ostensibly between London and Birmingham, but really also servicing Manchester Airport, given the Heathrow decision. Um, and, and, and yet, look, I'm in my home, Dale's in Stroud, we, we're, we're meeting without moving. We're folding space, we're using spice like Frank Herbert's June, you know. We don't need HS2. We, won't, we certainly won't need it in 30 years' time if it ever trundles the tracks. It's a, it's a fiasco. So we must just keep on fighting, and that's what we, we're doing. So um, I have another action taking. I can't reveal what it is at the moment because it, uh, I have to wait for it to come to fruition, but that should happen in the next, hopefully within the next week or so, um, and that's quite significant. So it's quasi-legal, and it will be happening soon. So... I'm still on the HS2 case. Nice one. Let me know if there's um, <clears throat> something that I can help you with, because uh, you know I share a sense of outrage of what's being done and, and the senselessness of what's being done. I love uh, meeting without moving, and, and I've loved doing this in lockdown. I think it's one of the gifts of the pandemic, actually. I've taken part in so many different events and conferences that I never would have done because it would have involved flying or traveling. Um, and I've really enjoyed it. This is, this is fabulous. You make a great point. In the future, we're going to need to move less because this kind of stuff works really well. Mm -hmm. We've got Chris and Dale for a little bit longer. Quick question for you, Chris. This is from Joe on Facebook. Um, off there. Is, your, is your new book suitable for an inquisitive 11-year-old who loves nature, or would it be a little hard for her? Uh, I, no, I don't think it would be hard for an 11 year old, um, certainly the language of it. I think a couple of the sections might be a little bit stolid. Um, I explore, you know, what's wrong with the government's statutory agencies, those that were responsible for looking after or meant to be looking after our wildlife. Um, so those, those sections are necessarily uh, a little dry because I have to frankly explain the problems there, principally under funding, basically, and, you know, serial cutting of, of, of funding um, to those and then there's another section which is a little bit tough about um, the, the parlous state of our national parks and, and why they are really are in, you know, could be in danger of losing their national park status by the very definitions that, that they are meant to satisfy. Um, but certainly I think many parts of the book are, um, are, are, are suitable for an 11 year old because they, they explore the ways that we have to make a positive difference. They certainly relate to us as individuals. There's a lot of stuff about the things that you and I can do, whether it's putting ponds in our gardens or growing wildflower patches in our gardens or lobbying. Um, and then also a lot, you know, there's quite a, quite a bit about what we eat and, and how we should make decisions about that. So I think that if I was 11, I'd be very happy to read that. I might skip a few pages of the boring stuff about national parks. Um, but equally, I'd be hoping that I'd grow into a world where our national parks are fit for purpose. So, yeah, and, um, and there's a lot of joy. And also, I should say, um, outside of the bits that I've written, the ranty bits, 
Um, Megan, my stepdaughter, has, has come up with a cocktail of remarkable new science and some very, very beautiful things about the natural world which have just been discovered, and they pepper the book. So she adds the, um, the scientific joy, whilst I, had the, I add the sort of environmental necessities to it. So I think that yes is the answer to that, a firm yes. Here's uh, another one, quick one for you from Jamie. What's it like working with Megan, and was the self-isolating bird club always planned to grow like it did, or did it take you guys even by surprise? Uh, no, it did take us by surprise. I think that we wanted to share our joy for the natural world in its simple terms, those things that were, were literally on our doorstep, they were in our garden. Um, and, um, you know, it was a time when people were confined to their homes and gardens if they were lucky enough to have them. And, you know, and I, that sort of stuff turns me on. And I started sharing it on social media and then we turned it into more of a program and we had contributors and obviously it was great to work alongside Megan. She has a shared passion for the environment and, and for activism and, and so forth. It's good to work with someone you know uh, because you know how far you can push them when it comes to taking the piss, um, and um, and I and she's someone I can rely on. You know, she she works really hard. She does good research and she knows her stuff, um, so that's good. And she's got first rate integrity. She believes it. She she's motivated by it. Well, she gets up in the morning. She wants to make a difference. So that that's all good. Rose on Facebook says, Dale, do you see more onshore wind farms being built now Boris has apparently decided to support them? Uh, <clears throat> no, not really. Certainly not the kind of scale that we need. I, I saw this week the announcement that uh, they're going to be allowed back into the funding regime. Contracts of difference is what it's called. Uh, but not until late 2021, for some reason. Uh, there's going to be, um, I think, a consultation period and it's only going to be for specific schemes that are basically uh, community-focused schemes. So for some reason, the, the Tories have decided that wind energy is, is a special case and it can only be built where it's uh, owned by local people and supported by the local council and, and that kind of stuff. I think it's really unfortunate because it just will hold onshore wind back. We could do so much more with it. Uh, you know, we have enough resource available, suitable land to power the whole country like four times over, um, but we're just held back by uh, ideology, really. Uh, AD on Facebook says, hi, gents, I'm considering joining the Green Party. Do you think they're a viable political party with an important role to play in the UK? And would either of you consider lending them your support or even joining them as an MP? Um, look, they're never going to be viable if people don't join them. <laughs> That's the first thing to say. Um, I think the Green Party, uh, you know, have some laudable I I ideas and ideals, and I think that if you if you look at how many seats they should have, given proportional representation, it would be a lot more than one. Um, so they do collect votes. It's just our system of voting doesn't allow them the degree of government governance that they they should be allowed. Um, and we know that in other parts of Europe, Green Parties have grown and prospered. Some of them have transformed into something else, but um, but certainly in Scandinavia, Germany, for instance, you know, the Greens of that movement from the 70s onwards um, managed to hold quite a lot of political sway. So I think the Green Party are certainly worth exploring. But ultimately, as Dale and I have said earlier, um, you know, whatever party you have, it's, it's our system of politics, which is never going to give that party the capacity to do the good that it needs to do. I think that's the problem that we, we face, which is why I've asked in the past that the issues that concern us, you know, greatly, environmental um, issues and, and, and wildlife conservation issues should be taken outside of politics because they're long term problems that need long-term investment and, and they need independent, fully independent um, decision-making and to be able to make fully independent in, in informed judgments. And, and you just don't get that consecutively with the politics you know, and the political system side that we've got at the moment. And I think that is a significant part of our, our handicap. Yeah, I agree. We tend to flip-flop, don't we, from one uh, administration to the other, from left to right, sometimes a little bit closer to the middle, but always we're changing 
every few years from one outlook to another, which is unfortunate. I think, you know, I support the Green Party. We've worked with them before, work with them now, we'll do in the future. You know, I've got a lot of time for them. Um, but we're stuck with the political system that we have. Um, and, you know, we, we have about 10 years to avoid the worst effects of the climate crisis. That's the scientific consensus. We're going to waste the first five years of that decade, in my opinion, with this government who just don't get it. Uh, and we're going to have five years left at the next election, five really important years. Uh, but, you know, there's no time even to lobby for proportional representation. We've got to, um, we've got to get the green message into one or both of the mainstream parties, the only two parties that can be in government. I think that's the job of, of, of green people. I met with um, uh, a candidate, a Green Party candidate, just before the election, and, and the first thing that she said to me was a complaint that Labour had taken all of the Green Party's policies. And I said, but you should be happy with that because that's the best chance you have of getting those policies implemented. Because the Green Party cannot realistically hope to be in government. I mean, that's just uh, that's just realism. Um, and I think I took part in a consultation with the Green Party recently, and they said, "What well, you know, what do you, what do you think the Green Party should aim to do?" And I said, "Actually, to make themselves redundant, because if the Green Party can have their policies adopted by the other the two main parties significantly." Uh, to the extent that they're no longer needed, that would be a success. If if green policies become the mainstream, that's a success. Uh, and that's again, just about uh, pragmatism. It's just where we are. I'm gonna hold on to Chris and Dale for another 15 minutes unless they hang up. So uh, you can still get your, you can get your questions into us and uh, we'll do our best to answer them. Here's one for you. This is from Julie. It's a question for you both. What are your thoughts on revelations from the hunting office webinar, which shows how complicit in illegal hunting so many former police officers are? Wow. Well, I mean, I haven't read, I haven't waded through all the three hours of it yet. Um, I've looked at the um, highlights or lowlights, and um, obviously ITV put the story out last night, and I've heard this afternoon that Forestry England have currently suspended all trail hunting on their land until pending the police investigation into the, these webinars. So in case you're not up to date, I'll just explain. Um, the hunting organisations held a series of Zoom webinars, um, and during the process of that, they have exposed the fact that they are, are trail hunting and as a means of hunting foxes. So as we've always said, it was a ruse, but they, in, in fact, they call it the smoke screen um, in their webinars. And the, the thing that relates to the police is that a number of um, retired police officers are present in these Zoom chats and they are advising the hunting fraternity, as far as I can see, on how to hide the fact that they're breaking the law. Um, it's, it's quite a raw expose of what we've always known is going on. Um, it's been you know, quite hard to break the story um, legally. So many of the newspapers, lawyers didn't want to go near it. But thankfully, some of the um, anti-hunting lobbyists have, been, have, have kept their resolve and they've managed to break the story through ITV last night and, and it's now in the public domain and it's being investigated by the police. And I'm really pleased to see that Forestry England have taken a, uh, the proper response to it and that is they've curtailed hunting until the results of the um, investigation. And we are asking at the moment National Trust, Ministry of Defence, United Utilities and others to take the same action to put it on hold to say no you, you, you can't if you're if you're going out to break the law and you've exposed this in these webinars you're not going to do it on our land uh, the national trust response is derisory currently um they're saying we're not breaking the law essentially they are but um, that doesn't i mean you know that doesn't work with me so it's it's up to us now to to pile on the pressure to put an end to this um despicable hobby and as I've often said, you know, I've no idea how long I'm going to live, but I do hope it's long enough to see it, an end to this. It's, you know, if I could choose one, I mean, there are a lot of things I'd like to choose of, of, of greater importance, but symbolically, the way that we still allow people to be pleasuring themselves, watching wildlife being torn to pieces by dogs in the 21st century, is so beyond, far beyond my comprehension that I hope it ends in my lifetime. I'd, I'd like to go to my grave knowing that that had finally been 
put to bed, finished. So that's what, where we are at the moment. And um, I, you know, I know that there's a lot of um, legislative things going on in the background. Um, and the, the hunting lobby have been well and truly caught with their jobbers down here, and, and then and they're clearly not happy about it. So it's going to be a tough, tough few weeks for some people that are trying to keep this in the public domain. They're working really hard to, to close it down. That's an amazing story. I was unaware of it. I'm going to go and look it up uh, when I leave here. Uh, I'm obviously against something like you. I just think it's an, an incredible thing that. Uh, that anybody would want to do, uh, and the ban on it uh, all those years ago by Labour government still rankles, of course, with a lot of people on the right of politics and uh, that live in the countryside. Um, but it also seems a little bit sweet to me, uh, kind of sweet justice, that this has been exposed uh, through webinars and possibly, Chris, through this idea of meeting without moving, you know, that the pandemic has given us, that these guys have yeah. come together and, yeah. and they've been exposed because uh, they've done it online. I yeah, well. Remember. The Harkonnens have been caught out. Actually, that's the that's the way it is, um, and they and they they've been exposed. Yeah. So, I I, I personally, as I said, do everything I can to make sure that this stays in the public domain and that people think about it and, and act upon it because it is horrendous. They've basically been caught saying we are illegally hunting. That's that's the, the, the to paraphrase it. That's from what I understand of it and what I've seen of it. That that's it. Question from Francis on Facebook for you, Chris. How does she get a signed copy of Back to Nature? Well, I don't know. I think we've signed an awful number of them, Megan and I. We seem to spend days uh, signing bits of paper. Um, so I know that there was a, an offer with Waterstones, and equally we've signed um, a, a huge number for independent bookshops too, um, because we like the idea of independent bookshops, of course. Um, and so um, we, we signed about a thousand for independent bookshops. So contact the easiest thing might be to contact your closest independent bookshop and see if they've got any. And I know the publishers were keen to distribute those as widely and to as many independents as they possibly could. Other than that, buy one and post it to us and we'll sign it and send it back. James on Facebook asks, uh, Na National Parks saw an unprecedented assault from visitors over the summer. How do we change the way we look at nature and national parks from theme parks to an essential part of, of being? Well, in the, in, our, in the book, the dry bit that I mentioned is, um, you know, asking whether our national parks are fit for purpose. And I guess I'm, fo I'm focusing principally on their ecological value. But equally, if we are to, you know, keep those national parks, then they have to satisfy certain criteria. And, and one of those criteria is that they can be used by us uh, for, you know, for essentially for recreation. And that when we go there, we should be able to enjoy the landscape and its wildlife. So they are closely allied. Um, but it's clear that the <laughs> management, um, <laughs> management that isn't being implemented at the moment, there's, there's no, no doubt about that. And, and that means some tougher restrictions. And, you know, you, if you go to one part of the world which are very fragile and very rare, then, um, then there are quite tight restrictions and, uh, and they work. They preserve those habitats. And there are some parts of our national parks where I think that we'll have I to think about guys, but I can't how, hear anything. And how often. And that's a fact of, 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 of modern life. The wonders of modern technology. We appear yes. to have lost Dale Vince's sound in the, in the process of this. Oh, he's back now. That's the wonders of modern technology. Uh, great. Um, Dale, your book's been described by one early reviewer as Mad Max meets Laurie Lee. Why have you written a book now and what was the reason for doing it now? That's a question from Shelley on Facebook. Yeah, I never had any particular uh, reason. It was kind of an idea that kicked around for a few years and, and then Penguin approached us at the end of last year and said, how about it? And, and it felt like the right time. Up until then, I thought that, um, you know, a number of years ago, it was just too soon, but I hadn't done enough to be, uh, you know, worth putting into a book. And, and there was also always stuff coming that I wanted to include in it, but I hadn't done it yet. It hadn't hit the world. And it was the same with this book, actually, because Sky Diamonds has been crammed or jammed into the end of the book. I think it's got like about one page as an epilogue. Um, it wasn't in the world, 
but I wanted it in the book and I knew if I put it in the book, I'd have to put it into the world probably before the book came out at the end of November. So I gave myself a hard deadline, um, which is a bit of fun. Um, but it just felt like the right time. And it was the, the lockdown was a gift really in that respect because I, I knew that I would struggle to find the time to write it. I knew I would struggle with the idea of a ghostwriter helping me to do that. Uh, and I bumped into the deadline um, in, in June. And then I just gave up the whole month. Uh, I spent every day at my computer uh, or walking on the common thinking about what I was going to write next. And I just started to assemble uh, <clears throat> the, the pieces of the puzzle. And I partly wanted to tell my story of living on the road and uh, using business as a tool to try and change the world, but also to get across a bit of my outlook uh, that, that's woven in with the experience and some of it is born from it and some of it was, was intrinsic. But most importantly, I wanted to write the final chapter, chapter 13, uh, the manifesto about this zero carbon plan, because I think it's really simple what we need to do and everything that we need to do is available to us. These are just choices that we have to make and it often looks really complex, uh, fighting the climate crisis and, and living more sustainably. And it often looks bigger than any of us can uh, do or, or to make a significant uh, dent in ourselves. And I think the truth is different to that. I wanted to set that out and how easy it could be for us actually to get to zero carbon as a country and all of the knock-on benefits of that as well. It's not just about zero carbon, it's about how we live. Um, so yeah, in the end, I um, was really excited uh, to write the book uh, you know, it got my complete attention. I really enjoyed it. And uh, I'm most excited about where Chapter 13 goes, getting into as many people's hands as possible. Um, all proceeds of the book are going to go to environment charities anyway. Uh, so it's not, a, <clears throat> it's not a commercial thing. Uh, but mostly it's about getting out this um, plan for how we, how we fix things. Zoe on uh, Facebook says, you're both EV drivers. Uh, I really want one, but don't feel that the UK is ready for it yet. What can you say to encourage me? Well, I, I, I've coming. done it. <clears throat> I, I think uh, if you mean charging infrastructure, for example, I think that's coming. Um, uh, the cars themselves are just getting cheaper. The, the manufacturing uh, industry have uh, said themselves, I think within 12 to 18 months, uh, electric cars will be cheaper than the petrol or diesel equivalents. They're already cheaper to run over the lifetime of a car. Uh, you talk about penny a mile instead of 15 p a mile, for example, hardly any moving parts, They're like a handful compared to several hundred, so much cheaper to maintain. And, uh, and of course, our, our government have come out with the uh, not so bold, really, uh, target to end uh, sales of new petrol and diesel cars by 2030. I say not so bold because I think it just reflects reality. The whole industry is moving this way anyway, and, and it will be done by then. So I think the next 10 years, we're going to see an incredible acceleration of EV adoption uh, on our roads. I think we already have in the last 10 years, because it was only 10 years ago that you couldn't buy an electric car. We went to try and buy one. There were none in the world. And so we made the nemesis. Then we built the electric highway off the back of that and in 10 years. Uh, the whole industry has transformed itself. All manufacturers have embraced EVs. They're all building and selling them and planning the day when that's all that they do. That's coming soon. So I would say it doesn't matter when you jump in, actually. At uh, some point in the next 10 years, you will jump in. Yeah, I would never go back, as I said. You know, I love, I love my electric car. And, I, and all of the people typically fear um, of, from electric cars i.e. range anxiety and, and not finding anywhere to charge it and so on and so forth. None of that has man manifested for me. Mm -hmm. And I, I live in the south of England, a bit of Scotland a couple of times. I just go anywhere. It's, 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 it's not a problem at all. Yeah. <clears throat> your behavior, but apart from that, it's, it, it, it's, it's fine. But the one thing that Bell's mentioned is the price needs to come down. Yeah, exactly. Uh, the wonders of modern technology. We may well have lost Dale's headphones, which is a slightly disappointing way to end the evening. You might not be able to hear us. Chris, you're restarting the self isolating bird club um, on Sunday. It's going weekly. What can viewers expect if they go to your YouTube channel? I think more the same. Celebration of the nature around us, reflecting what's going on at the moment. Um, we'll be getting guests from around the world it's asking them to, me. to uh, contribute what they what what's their their passion at the moment it's again very much a platform for for young people and their ideas um and then megs will be bringing her cutting edge clients and then we'll have our soapbox section because we do feel that you know um a lot of people have learned 
this year through the uh, pandemic that nature has a lot to offer. And in a way, not in an exploitative way, but in a way they've taken from nature. And like we say in the book, it's now about putting something back. If you've developed an affinity, if you've opened your ears, eyes and noses to the fact that the world around you offers enormous richness, potential solace and respite, mental health benefits, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, um, then you need to look after that world. Um, so whilst it's still not a, a full on campaigning platform, we will be talking about um, some of the campaigns that people ought to be aware of if they can, if they want to look after, look after that nature for, for their future and for their kids and so on and so forth. But, you know, lots of, we've got some, obviously we haven't, we took time out for Autumn Watch. So we've sort of banked a whole load of um, good films and things that will be coming up in the next, in the next month or so. And we're also, um, at the moment, we've done a calendar and we're selling the calendar to raise funds to buy some quite expensive technical equipment. And um, we are hoping that we can radically transform the self-isolating bird club broadcast um, by being able to go on the road, basically, um, come out of our homes and, and a fixed space and roam about. So we're exploring that at the moment. And if we can raise the money, then we'll buy the technology. And hopefully by the time we get to after Christmas, we'll have uh, a greater capacity to bring wildlife into people's homes, which would be great. Uh, Dale is still battling with his technology, which is a, a sad way to end. But uh, we have to do Marcel Marceau style uh, mime in a second because he's unfortunately lost audio. But Chris, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, just tell people where can they get your book and um, uh, just remind us the name of the book and where they can get it. Well, here's the book. Um, it's uh, Back to Nature, How to Love Life and Save It. Um, as I mentioned earlier, Megs has got some gems of science in here, which are truly astonishing. Birds dream about singing. And in fact, they dream so vividly about singing that if they were to exercise their lungs whilst they slept, they would be singing in their sleep. This one little nugget that she's uh, discovered. Um, and these pepper the book. So, you know, they serve to, you know, you know, explain to everyone and, and demonstrate to everyone that what fuels us, what fuels our concern and the bits that I write about, which are about making sure that we fix the problems that we've, we've wrought upon the natural world, um, are, um, you know, all come from a, a genuine deep-seated affinity and, and, and love for that natural world. Uh, but it is a manual. This is a manual. This is saying to people, look, you know, rather like Dow's manifesto, you know, there are problems and frankly, you need to help fix them because they, who we've been discussing all night, are, are not going to fix them in the short term. So it's a, it's a clarion call to people to say, if you love it, um, love life, you, you know, you need to save it. Anyway, where do you get it? Oh, you, you, it's obviously all the usual places, independent bookshops um, were, were somewhere I would push towards because I like those sorts of things. But obviously all the other key book retailers have them as, as well. As if by magic, Dale has joined me on the other camera in the office. So I'm going to move out of shot so Dale could just say a few final words. There we go. Yeah, my computer's malfunctioned. I don't know what's going on, but we always have a little technical problem. It wouldn't be the same without it. Chris, I just want to thank you for, for taking part in this. It's been like really fabulous to have this chat and thank everybody that's been watching as well. Um, I just loved it. So thank you very much. And uh, don't forget, everybody, leaning back into the shop, Chris's Self-Isolating Bird Club starts again this Sunday, www.youtube.com forward slash SI Bird Club. Uh, and that's it. Thank you very much, Chris. We'll speak to you soon. Thanks so much. We didn't even talk about football. We managed to get through it without too much four screen rovers. We'll have to do it again. <laughs> speak to you later. Cheers. Bye. Yeah, cheers, Chris.